So, we ended the uh, first lesson uh, on talking about models. Just to summarize, models are an essential tool in order to uh, uh, make us able to think. Without models, we cannot think, we cannot operate. In science, models are essential because science is inherently uh, about complex objects and phenomena. So, to think about those objects and phenomena, we need to have models, we need to elaborate model, models, uh, we need to uh, switch from one model to the next uh, whenever necessary, whenever the previous model does no longer fit the, our interests, the, the phenomena uh, we are interested in. Okay, so let's uh, quickly finish this lesson and, uh, and, uh, and finish with, the, uh, with a few more definitions then, and then we'll switch to the second lesson. So, uh, definition of theory. Explanation of specific aspects of the natural world grounded on solid scientific basis. So, first of all, a theory is an explanation. Not to be confused with, the, with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a tentative explanation. A theory is an end point. After accumulating knowledge, after doing experiments, after performing observations, eventually we come up with theories. Theories, we'll see it in a few minutes, uh, are not definitive. It is not that because we have a theory, we now understand a phenomenon or a, or a sector of reality. But a theory is an explanation of those phenomena, and I would say a non-trivial explanation, in the sense that we can uh, trivially explain whatever we like, for example, we might say that the apple we are talking about in the last lesson uh, goes to the ground because everything goes to the ground. That's a theory, but just in the uh, most trivial, uh, 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 in the most trivial sense, much better is a theory which postulates the existence of a, of a, you know, of a force that pulls down object that pulls them actually not down but to the center, towards the center of the Earth. Um, and it is not trivial, also in the sense that oftentimes, and nowadays, a theory, a scientific theory, is uh, unexpected. The first time you hear about the theory, you are usually surprised. You, you usually, uh, 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 you are amazed at how different things are presented by the theory compared to the intuitive uh, 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 understanding of the phenomenon. For example, uh, uh, let's say, uh, okay, you name please some well-known scientific, scientific theories. Evolutionary. The evolutionary theory, okay. So, that's a non-trivial theory. In fact, Darwin had to find, had to find a, lot, a lot in order to uh, get it accepted. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, um, it makes you wonder the first time you hear about it. It is much easier to suppose that uh, you know, the famous giraffe uh, increases the length of its, uh, of its neck because it reaches higher and higher rather than supposing that through selection, generation after generation, we select uh, um, giraffes with uh, uh, longer and longer necks. So, uh, other theories? The um, That's rather a low than a theory. We, we'll see it in a second. Gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are. Monsterized. Sorry? Monsterized. 
Yes, but it's uh, a prediction. Right. The uh, uh, relativity, general relativity predicts that we should observe gravitational waves as we did fairly recently. Other theories, not necessarily biological. Mm -hmm. And the symbiotic theory. Okay, and the symbiotic theory. Uh, that's another uh, surprising theory, right? So we were uh, accustomed to think that uh, mitochondria were organs, like many other in the cell, and suddenly somebody tells us, well, no, it's not. It's, it's the remnant of a previous microorganism, also the bacteria. Yes, so uh, oftentimes theories are surprising. Uh, we are now accustomed, or we know them, we, we get accustomed to them, we can see that they're natural, but they are. They are the result of many, many uh, years of thinking, of observing, of experimenting, of theorizing, and finally they are still for our life of, of, a, of a large amount of uh, scientific work. So, uh, just a note here, the colloquial use of these words often does not reflect this definition, meaning that sometimes, oftentimes in uh, the, uh, in our everyday life, we say, you know, I'm thinking this, but it's just a theory. You know? Just to say it's a trivial hypothesis uh, which is not worth its, uh, uh, which is uh, worthless. Uh, but that is not the case. In fact, theories in science are the end product. Really, what, what we're striving to, uh, uh, um, to reach with our, with our uh, scientific investigation. Then low, coming to my mind. A short statement of natural facts, strongly based on scientific evidence, like theory, with strong predictive power. Usually, it can be expressed in mathematical form, and thus makes quantitative predictions. So, Mendel's theory, and uh, Mendel's law, um, laws, actually, plural. Uh, predict mathematically uh, how many uh, heterozygous, homozygous uh, organisms you'll uh, you get from a given, uh, a given cross. Other laws that you can think of? Thermodynamics go. Laws of thermodynamics. Yes, uh, thermodynamics really, uh, they are often called laws of thermodynamics, uh, but uh, they should rather be called principles of thermodynamics. Uh, it's the next definition. <laughs> uh, so you're always ahead of, uh, of what you're talking about, but it's okay, right? It's very good. Uh, so uh, a law is, uh, Basically, it reflects the uh, most common, the more common uh, use of the word. It's like a, a, a human law. It states that whenever we are in a certain condition, this will happen. And this will happen in a quantitatively predictive, predictable way. And the law really allows you to calculate exactly what you will observe. And like a human law, it applies to every, every instance of that situation that the law describes. So whenever you cross organisms, you expect Mendel's laws to apply. Of course, within the real realm of what they apply to. Finally, a principle. This is a vague definition, a theorem for a scientific law applicable to a wide part of reality. So, for example, the principles of thermodynamics are applicable to basically the whole universe. Uh, and as such, uh, in my opinion, they should rather be called principles than law. Uh, the reason is that the law is more limited. It's limited to specific facts, specific phenomena, as common as varied as may be, uh, but the principles are uh, at a superior level. They encompass a series of laws, uh, oftentimes a series of theories as well. 
So they are overarching principles. Alright, the way these, uh, these words are used is not always consistent in that uh, it is sometimes historically determined. The laws of thermodynamics have been called such uh, a century ago, more than a century ago actually, two or three centuries ago, uh, and, uh, and nowadays we still call them that way, but we should rather call them principles as they are called sometimes. Uh, and sometimes we call, uh, we, we use theory to describe the principle or law, etc. So again, the definitions you see here are my best effort to give you uh, definitions that fit the best use of these words, but they are not absolute, they are not universally accepted. And with this, uh, we're finished with the first lesson. So, to better answer your question, uh, a trivial explanation would be, uh, remember the, uh, the police investigator uh, that we talked about in the last lesson. So, the police investigator might have a trivial, uh, a trivial uh, uh, theory. If he said, somebody must have killed this guy. That's a theory, yes. But it's very trivial and doesn't, doesn't help anybody. Uh, a better theory is, given the circumstances of this killing, I suppose that's a hypothesis actually, uh, I suppose that the killer is a left-handed woman, uh, uh, less than 40 years of age, etc. All right, so in this and the next lesson, we're going to go uh, fairly quickly through the thinking of two major uh, philosophers who really shape the way we, uh, we scientists uh, think about science nowadays. But before we go into that, I'll ask you a question. How much do we trust science? I would like every one of you to, to give an answer. Do we trust science? Until it's proved wrong, yes. Until it's proved wrong. Other answers? Depends from, uh, from the problem that we, we observe. So, so sometimes we do and sometimes yeah. we don't. Yeah, sometimes we can have uh, all the answer and sometimes we have not, so we can... Well, of course, we, the question means, yeah. uh, we trust, do we trust science when it has answers? Do, yeah. we? do we? We can uh, explain with a scientific uh, graphic method. Yeah, we, I trust in it. You trust it absolutely or up to a point? And if so, to what point? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, whatever science says is it, absolutely true. Okay. You're, you're right. I'm interested in your opinion, actually. This is not a test. I remember I studied in bioethics mm -hmm. that there are like, uh, in the last decade, there is a lot of um, scientific fraud, in, you know, in, like in publication and the articles, so there is manipulation of data. So, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, there are some things that uh, a lot of countries and a lot of research groups search all together, and that I I think I will trust like one hundred percent. But um, we have to, I trust that maybe uh, the articles have to be reviewed by a group of 
uh, other scientists before they are pub published, for example. So maybe it also depends on which journal is going to publish that article or who okay. wrote it. What your answer is that whenever we're talking about good science, mm -hmm. no frauds, oh, no okay. errors, etc., uh, you would okay. trust 100 percent the answers of science. Yes. <laughs> okay. How about you? By the way, your name is Bill. Daniele. Daniele Karim. Karim. Ginevra. Ginevra. Sì. Valeria. Ginevra, please. Um, I think that uh, <coughs> science uh, is one of the most um, important things uh, for every people, and we trust um, a lot in science. A lot and is not absolute. Absolutely not, but um, everyone trusts science. Mm -hmm. I think so. So, me, are we absolutely? Yeah, yes. Okay. So, uh, the most skeptical thinker about you is Daniele, who yeah. said, you know, science is trustworthy until it's proven wrong. But then the next question is if it is always possible to trust that, that, that science can be proven wrong. Why do you trust it at all? The question is, if it is possible that tomorrow, yeah. today's statements from science will be proven wrong, why do you trust them today? I trust them because you believe in science you can look at the world and a picture. And you can only look for something particular, but it may be that a new discovery uh, shakes the uh, grounds and your conditions holds. So, I mean, I trust it today because I know it's true right today. It's, it's true. And so I can base my experience, for example, on what I know. But I even know that it might be wrong my assumptions. So I trust it because I need it. I need to trust it. All right. Uh, let's, let's make an example. Let's say uh, centuries ago people thought scientists at that time thought that the earth was flat. Now at that time we would have believed it because that was science. Now we know it is not. So, why do you believe it now that it is more or less round? If perhaps tomorrow somebody else will tell you that it is not round, but something else, which is not so inconceivable. Right? <laughs> so. At one time, people thought, science thought that the earth was flat. And you, at that time, you would have believed them. You would have believed science, because that, that was the, that the science of the time. So, now scientists are telling you that, that the earth is flat. Tomorrow, they might be telling you that it's cylinder. That would be the scientific truth of tomorrow. Now, even this historical perspective, why do you believe that? To, why do you believe today that the science that the Earth is round? Because it, it has been in a mathematical way since long ago, since millennia ago. I think uh, about the Rodolfo, who proved it was round with a, a mathematical model. Then we went when send people around the orbit and they are seeing the Earth and they're saying it's wrong. All right. Uh, okay, so we have uh, mathematical, mathematical proofs uh, and visual evidence. Visual evidence. Yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, uh, those are both good basis for what we believe today. And yet, in principle, the question remains, if anything can be proven wrong, why do you believe it at all? Because not everything can be proved wrong. Okay, so okay. there are statements of 
in today's science or tomorrow's science, whatever, that will never be proved wrong. And it's an We need it, we know. We as humans, because of yeah. course there are yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, yeah, that's that's hard to deny, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanna try. <laughs> but still, uh, uh, in principle, uh, when it's not impossible to to conceive of a human being. And they're that adapting uh, to another. Uh, by slowly adapting, uh, perhaps, perhaps helped by technology. Let's say we put this human, uh, this human being in deep sleep so that his metabolism was very, very, very low. He might survive with little or no oxygen. So we don't absolutely need oxygen. We need oxygen in the ordinary conditions in which we live. Yeah. Um, so, for the time being, let's stop here. But I'll, uh, I'll come back to you uh, with a similar with a similar question after we finish. But it's but, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think that you come out with uh, an important thing that for now in this condition we need it. So I think that the science law uh, has to be considered in uh, in some condition. Yeah. I can take for true uh, a law, a science law, in this condition. Definitely. What we do in science is carefully try to circumscribe where truths yes. are valid, truths are valid, and where they are not necessary. Yes. Okay. So let's go to our to uh, the first one of our thinkers. Uh, and let's start from where it started from, from inductivism, which was founded uh, founded by uh, Francis Bacon, uh, in Italian also, Bacone, uh, in, uh, uh, in the 17th century. Essentially, Bacon thought that the uh, scientific law stems from a large compilation of observations, a large compilation of uh, as conservation of data. So, uh, Bacon said that a scientist should, first of all, erase every preconceptions from his mind, and then create a table with, with observations pertinent to, uh, to whatever it was uh, the scientist was investigating, and from those tables, eventually, a law would come up. That would be a natural law. So in Bacon's thinking, what scientists, scientists have to do is to uh, collect a lot of observations, systematically uh, put them on tables, analyze them, and derive the law. Does it make sense or not? It does. At all. Mm -hmm. Well, that's stupid. No, <laughs> it's not that stupid, but it's not uh, the only thing you need. I mean, if you measure the way the temperature of the water boiling in this room for a thousand times, it will be always uh, around. around, 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 around. Yeah. But if you measure it from the top of uh, Everest, it will be lower. So you can state that. Uh, Water boils at 100 degrees. As Karen said, you gonna if you change the condition. Uh, you, you have to define with, with what conditions your law is valid. Yes. But it was not stupid from that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Bacon was, uh, uh, I would say, reflecting our natural way of thinking. What we do. Uh, in order to, first of all, conceive of laws, to derive hypotheses, is to find regularities. Whenever we see things happening over and over again, 
we tend to think, in fact, our brain is hardwired in order to, to find regularities. We find regularities even when they do not exist, where they do not exist. Uh, because our brain attempts to uh, look for regularities. And from those, we derive laws, or at least hypotheses that then should be confirmed. But anyway, uh, Bacon at the time uh, started, uh, in a way, uh, modern thinking about uh, about science and thought that a large number of observations was enough to derive a scientific work. Then, much later, came uh, the positivists, uh, whose uh, ancestor was Kant, and their way of thinking was called verificationism. Uh, whereby they attempted to find a method to definitively verify scientific laws. That is, demonstrate that they are true. True, period. True, never to be disproved. Right, this didn't work. They never uh, could find ways to prove definitively true scientific law or anything else. Good. So, our thinker is Karl Popper, whose thinking was called falsification, even. you'll see why. And Popper was a very influential uh, philosopher, not only in science, not only in epistemology, but in other domains of philosophy. Uh, and he published a capital uh, book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, in 1930. So, he started uh, just by criticizing the previous two schools of thinking that I briefly talked about, uh, particularly uh, the, the stance of Bacon, by uh, proposing, a, proposing a simple example. The refutation of inductivism, Bacon's inductivism, goes like this. Popper took a uh, an example that is that was used by uh, Aristotle, actually, uh, for, other, for other purposes. Uh, he talked about swans, and he said, "Well, say, uh, say a scientist that finds a uh, white swan, he takes note of it. That's it. Then he uh, looks for another swan." finds it is white. Then he looks for other swans, and again, finds that none of them are white. And he keeps looking, and whenever he finds a, finds a swan, he finds it is white. At some point, according to Bacon, he will derive the law according to which all swans are white. According to Bacon, this is a definitive law of science. Swans are white. Here. But Popper says that this doesn't make any logical sense because this theory can be disproved by simply finding a swan which is not white, a black swan. So it doesn't really matter how many white swans you might observe. Your law that all swans are white will never be proven definitively because there, is, will, there will always be the possibility of finding a swan of a different color. From a logical point. Now you might say, well, okay, so let's modify the law a little and say that most swans are white and some others are not. Well, but you know, Hopper might object that this is. This is not what Popper said, but I, I'm interpreting this thing. Popper might say, well, but it is possible that there are large colonies of black swans somewhere that we haven't observed yet, and so even this second formulation of the law mm -hmm. is not correct. And then you might say, well, okay, so swans are white and black, but there might be red swans, etc., etc., etc. So, first of all, according to Popper, you are not allowed to twist the theory more than so much. You cannot adjust it a little, but 
if you change it too much, you, are, you simply have a new theory. You are not adjusting to, uh, to accommodate the few uh, new observations. Second, and this is the most important thing, Popper was approaching the way science is done from the logical point of view. He uh, basically never talks about, or very rarely, it is quite a thick book, uh, uh, ever talk about real uh, scientific laws, real experiments, real observations. He talks about uh, generic examples like, such as these formal examples. Because all he, he cares about is the logic of scientific discovery. And so he says, inductivism will never prove a scientific law. Uh, and, and, and in this, it was backed up by another philosopher in the 20th century philosopher who was um, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, uh, who uh, was a uh, British philosopher, uh, who uh, told the story about the uh, Inductivist uh, target. Forgive me, I'm a little bit The inductivist target. Now, targets in the Anglo Saxon world, uh, world are believed to be uh, very stupid, much as we uh, treat chickens. So, if you want to offend somebody, you can tell them he's a target. And so he said, you know, the, uh, this target uh, observed. That every morning at 9 a.m., he was fed. But because he was a good inductivist, he was not happy with just a few observations, and he kept making observations and found that indeed he was fed at 9 o'clock when it was raining, or the, or the was sun, when it was really sunny, whether uh, it was uh, a busy day or a quiet day, whether there was wind. And so, after collecting many, many of these observations, he finally devised the law that food always comes at 9 a.m., which was clamorously disproved on the eve of, uh, of Christmas when he was killed at 9 o'clock. So, this is to say again that just one observation can disrupt the Scientific law derived. Oh, by the way, black swans do exist, but they are in Australia, and so Aristotle couldn't know them. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a theory? A theory attempts to explain reality. I depicted reality with a dashed line or a dashed uh, or an area surrounded by a dashed because what rela uh, reality is, is not science, it's metaphysics. You might have different opinions about what is reality. But theory strives to explain reality, whatever you think reality is. A good theory should explain every aspect of the reality it applies to. In principle, a good theory should be completely superimposable on reality. Whatever we observe in reality should have been predicted by the theory, should fit within the theory. Nothing should be out of the theory within that realm. So, nonetheless, Popper says that there is no way to prove a scientific theory, proving the strong sense of the world. That is, to demonstrate it is true in an absolute sense. Because there are neither logical, with the cynic, with the swans, nor empirical criteria to do so. Logically, no matter how many observations, how many experiments we run, we always have the possibility of finding one piece of evidence which goes against the theory and the, and the, and the theory will crumble down. It will be 
follows your file. Empirically, nobody has come up with a suggestion on, on how practically, true, definitively, definitively. And of course, Popper strongly does that anybody will ever come up with such a, such a suggestion. And he will explain uh, later on. So, Popper says that. As a consequence, the scientific theories cannot be demonstrated, which is kind of unsettling for, for scientists uh, or would be scientists such as you. But he says, you know, this is true, but it is also true that they can be falsified. That is demonstrated to be false. Now, this doesn't as a consolation is not such a great thing, apparently. But it does say something important. Because... Sorry? No, I think that uh, this is the concept that Daniel tried to explain. Yes. Right. I don't know whether Daniel knew already about proper thinking, but, but reflected that yeah. thinking in another life. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly some reference. Okay, so, for the reason we have, we have already seen in part, scientific theories cannot be demonstrated. However, they can be falsified. That is, uh, there is an asymmetry. Truths can never be established. But falsity can. If we find a black swan, we are sure that that theory was false. We will never find enough white swans to prove definitively true that all swans And Popper says uh, that the scientific proof, uh, sorry, a scientific theory to be considered such must be falsified. It's a condition for a scientific, for a theory to be scientific. We'll come back to that. So basically Popper says at some point in time. There is a, an accepted scientific theory which uh, accounts for all known observations. All observations concerning that sector of reality must be accounted for by the theory, otherwise there would be at least one observation that is not included in the theory, and so the theory will be false. But of course, scientists keep making observations, keep making experiments, and eventually it might happen that one fact comes up that doesn't, it is not explained by the theory. It is not reconcilable with the theory, and so the theory is falsified. So, uh, what scientists have to do is to devise another theory, which now case replaces with this one, and is capable of accounting for all the previous observations plus the one that has made the previous theory uh, all done. And then more facts will be accumulated, and at some point another unreconcilable fact might come up, and so we uh, will have to devise a new theory, and so on. This is the way uh, uh, Popper thinks scientific thinking. Science progress. Now, as I was saying, uh, Popper stated that scientific theories must be falsified, which means that, uh, similar to what Daniel said last time, not everything, not every question is a scientific question. And so, not every reality we can think of is a, uh, a piece of reality approachable by science. Perfect. This is an example, an example of mine. No. Think of uh, history. That's a very respectable and very usable uh, uh, part of our knowledge, and yet it is not science. For two good reasons. 
First of all, because observations in history are always unique. The same situation, exactly the same situation, never repeats in history. And, even less so, we can run experiments with history. We cannot wipe out of the map, say, the country, or kill a king and see what, what will happen. But we cannot run experiments with history. Uh, and so, it is very difficult. History attempts to make prediction, but they are very soft, and often, and oftentimes they are out of the target. So, history is not science. That doesn't mean it isn't an important part of our knowledge. It's just something that you cannot approach with the scientific method. Do you have methods to approach history? Historians do use their methods, but that's not probably called science according to them. Others might have different views. And then again, to be falsifiable, scientific theories must make verifiable predictions. Now, this is very important because it, it determines what is a scientific theory and what is not. The scientific theory takes the known observations, explains them, and it usually makes predictions, that is, predictions, that is, we can foresee what you will observe if you run a certain experiment that's never been run, if you make a certain observation that's never been made. That's a prediction, and that's the condition of verifiability. You must be able to do that, to, to run that experiment. You must be able to do that, that, observation, that, that observation. If there are no verifiable predictions, then you don't have a scientific theory. Uh, to go back to uh, the nearest example, it's a uh, lesson. If you say, you know, there is a God, we cannot see, we cannot here we cannot touch, we cannot smell. This is not a scientific theory. It is a respectable theory. We call it religion. It's another, it's another matter. All right, so because of all, all, of it, all that we have said so far, all human knowledge remains fallible, conjecture. Right? So, In a way, that causes a problem uh, for both Daniel's view, which was at one extreme in this class, uh, and their views, the girls' views, uh, to explain myself, it has nothing to do with gender. Uh, according to which science is very trustworthy. And yet, Popper says, human knowledge will remain valuable and conjectural forever. And that's the reason why he asked the, the, that question initially. How much do we trust science? And I'll ask it again. Popper adds, even if, even if we divide the theory that adheres perfectly to reality, remember those two uh, uh, disks I've shown you. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that we devise a theory which is perfectly adherent to reality. It, it explains reality perfectly, and we will never be able to uh, uh, make an observation which is not uh, in agreement with the theory. The theory is perfect. We'll never be able to run an experiment that goes against the theory. The theory is perfect. Even if we had such a theory, and perhaps we already have it, we wouldn't know, because the only logically acceptable verification would be to perform all possible observations and all conceivable experiments, which is clearly impossible. This is basically restating, uh, that is, generalizing the swan example. If we could observe all the swans in the world, we might conclude that they are all white, if they are. But we cannot see them all.
And so it's not impossible for a theory to be broken. But we can never know that we have a broken theory. And so we, we will still be uncertain about science, at least in the sense that we can never consider definitively the statements of science. And yet, I might add, this is not proper, science is the best way we have to know all the world. In the realms, again, to which science applies. There is no better instance, there is no better way to know the world than science. So we trust science, we rely on science at least, even though we know that science fails often. It's failed all the time throughout history, and there is no question it will fail again. Nonetheless, it's our best way to understand the world. And so we trust science because we have no better option. Okay, so one final question would be another question would be if it is so that science is always uh, fallible and conjectural, <clears throat> what about our feeling that our knowledge increases, that our understanding of nature improves? Is that real or is it? An idea of ours, a consolatory idea of ours, that really does not reflect our uh, an increasing understanding of reality. Because we switch from one theory to the next, as I've shown you. Uh, and so you might argue that we never move from the place we are. We just switch from one theory to another. What do you think of this? Do we really progress? Does really our knowledge progress, or does it not? Daniele thinks so. Karim? Oh, no, I need two minutes to think about it. <laughs> All right, legitimate. Uh, remind me of Ginevra. Ginevra. Ginevra? What does Ginevra think? I don't understand why you answered the question. Okay. So, the question is, we generally, perhaps you don't, but we generally suppose that human knowledge increases with time, that our understanding of the world, of the universe, improves, gets better and better with time. But if we, uh, uh, but if we, all we do all the time is switching from one theory to the next, is it really true that we improve, or we are just, you know, Modifying our point of view, moving in no specific direction. Sometimes we uh, we have the, our progressions, but our progression, but sometimes uh, we remain in the same point. Possible. Well, yeah. mm. I think we do progress <coughs> with our knowledge. Maybe it's not like we're going towards 100% of knowing the world because it's impossible. Like we will never, we never, will never reach know. that. But uh, we know things that centuries ago people didn't know, and um, I don't know. Maybe one day all of this will be proven wrong. But we live in this moment and. In this moment, we know a lot of things, and I think we are going somewhere. So, today's theory is certainly better than, say, the theory devised a couple of centuries ago. Your, your yes. It is. Why is it? Yeah, justify your opinion, your um, intuition, let's say. We do have a scientific and we always keep coming up Even with... those people thought they had said Yes. <laughs> uh, it, it is very possible that in a few centuries everything we know would be completely proven wrong. 
but for now... For many things. Let's <laughs> not say that. I hope not, but... Um, we just keep uh, coming out with new um, uh, scientific uh, experiments that will just keep on showing that we are thinking in the right way and that we are we have a correct picture of what the situation is. Uh, I speak from a biological point of view, obviously. And, yeah, I think. Okay. Uh, yes. Do you want something? Okay. Karin, have you had enough time to think? Yeah, yeah I think that uh, I will dump the dump talk because we can increase our knowledge, but uh, when we study something, we found uh, a new part that we need to, to study again. And I don't know, I think about a library uh, with um, a book. When we take a book in the back, we find uh, 10 books again. So we have to start. And if we start with one book after this, we have uh, a lot of things that we uh, need to know to, to um, per comprehend the human But mm -hmm. so we can do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting metaphor. Uh, because in a way... Aumenta il volume di quello che dobbiamo conoscere. Per cui, cioè, di fatto, la nostra conoscenza in percentuale si è abbassata ma eh, abbiamo acquisito delle conoscenze dal primo libro, quindi c'è cioè, l'ho visto un po' più. Ok, let's see what Popper would answer. Uh, he would say something not so distant from, from what you just said. He would say that in this progression, first of all, there is a very clear fact. Which theory mm -hmm. explains previous facts plus at least one more, plus at least one more. So, every new theory explains at least one more fact. So, it is progressive. And in fact, it's like, oops, uh, it's like evolution. Each theory tends, not necessarily does, but tends to come closer to reality because it explains more and more facts. It's been uh, uh, selected among competing theories to be the best one at that time point in history to explain whatever was known at that time. So it's a sort of evolution based on the fact that uh, new theories, as you said with your books, should explain more and more facts. Right? Every new theory needs to explain more facts than the previous one, at least one. All right. So, all of this sounds a bit abstract, and that's because it is. I know that. Because Popper was really thinking of science in an abstract way. In fact, uh, he started from very uh, from real science. He stated that his book, the first idea of his book, stemmed from a conference by Einstein who he attended. Uh, and so, on thinking about Einstein theories uh, and video theories and so on, he realized this view of how science and science works. And so but his uh, uh, Popper's point of view is purely logical. So he doesn't, doesn't speak about Einstein or, or, or any, again, any uh, specific facts in science. He speaks about the naked logic of science in, in an abstract way. Okay, so let's apply proper thinking to an actual biological phenomenon. Here is a statement. Although cardiomyocytes are terminally differentiated, which means osmitopic, which means they cannot divide, they cannot proliferate. Is that true or not? It is not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, this is just a guess. You really don't know. I don't know. No. Okay. 
Let me just fill this thing. It's true, but uh, in some condition they can uh, betray. They it can, wrong, uh, it's true, but uh, in some condition that uh, we create in the laboratory, they can retrograde. Uh, um, <laughs> They can de differentiate, they can uh, <laughs> go back in differentiation yes. and proliferate, is that what you want to say? We, we can create the, the condition to, uh, I don't know how to say, to, to change, okay, to change the, the destiny of the, the cell. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, basically, even nowadays, I check every year with the students, this is what they are told, that although cardiomyocytes are terminally differentiated, like quite many other cell types that are terminally differentiated, they cannot produce. That's why uh, cardiac lesions cannot be repaired other than with a scar. So you don't make new uh, cardiac muscle, you just make a scar. If you have a cardiac infarction, uh, that's what you get, a scar. If you're lucky, otherwise you just run. Well, oh, 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 but it is, it is important what she never says, because she knows at least that people have devised ways to make cardiomyocytes proliferate. And so, first of all, this statement is not really absolute. What even Ginevra doesn't know, because it's not told here, apparently, is that cardiomyocytes are naturally capable of doing that. And that was shown like uh, um, about just 25 years ago. Uh, by a cardiologist here on Versa, his name is Italian, but he's American, who showed that in, in failing hearts, that is, hearts that no longer have the strength to pump enough to make their owner survive, in failing hearts, he could observe myocytes, cardiomyocytes, early Later on, he showed that even in normal parts, there is proliferation, though tenfold less. How did he do that? Well, his initial observations were very easy, very simple. He looked hard at many, many sections of human hearts from autopsies. And he found that occasionally, cardiomyocytes here, those are W of fluorescences. Uh, Red is uh, stains troponin T, which is exclusively, it's a, it's a contractile protein exclusively expressed by cardiomyocytes. And green is DNA. Okay, so why is, uh, it, it, was he it, was it using uh, a stain for troponin T? Because, of course, in the cardiac tissues, there are not only Myocytes, but also other cell types such as uh, fibroblasts, immune cells, uh, endothelium, etc., etc. So he needed to be sure that what what he was observing was indeed within cardiomyocytes and not another cell type. What he could occasionally observe was mitotic figures such as this in cardiomyocytes. Recognized because they were troponin T positive. This is telophase, this is a metaphase, this is also a metaphase, another telophase, another metaphase. So, the statement I showed you before, cardiomyocytes are post mitotics, has been believed for at least about 50 years. It was standard scientific proof. Here. Point is that that state, statement was based on observations made uh, 
70, 80 years ago with the technology of the time. That technology was not sensible enough, sensitive enough to detect rare instances of dividing carbon dioxide such as these. These examples are not as frequent as these images suggest. These are select images. In fact, it is very rare to catch a, a dividing carbon dioxide. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the only way to do it, even nowadays, is by looking hard, by spending time at the microscope. So, this is a lesson, it's like a black swan. If you look hard enough, you might find a black swan. And then the theory that cardiomyocytes are of metabolic is gone. In fact, now we know, or we pretend to know, that cardiomyocytes are now with a limited ability to divide. They divide probably once or twice in a lifetime, no more than that. And this is so rare that it is calculated that within our lifetime, only about half of the cardiac tissue is replaced by new cardiomyocytes. That explains why, basically, myocardial infarction heals with scar. Because within the limited time that the healing takes, you only have you can only make a scar. There is no time to uh, have myocardiomyocytes replace the most ones. Unless you treat them in specific ways that allow them to proliferate faster and Okay, so this is a uh, relatively small example. It applies only to our hearts, to mammalian hearts. But it shows you uh, that what Popper was saying was not simply abstract. It, it is entirely applicable to real science. It, ha it, it happens often that we, have, we realize that we have overlooked, have overlooked uh, aspects of reality and, uh, and made the wrong theories created from theories because uh, of those uh, failures. So, going back to the question, all the human, to, to the statement, all human knowledge remains valuable conjecture. I think it was the first year in which I was teaching this course at Tor Vergata, when the students had asked, even mathematics, Interesting question, I said. And then I asked the student, why are you asking? What is special in mathematics? Why should be more certain than all other sciences? So we have uh, also law in mathematics. Yes, but we have both in mathematics. Uh, the, the question was a good one. Yeah. But why was he asking? She asked me, it was an experiment. We use mathematical um, laws uh, to, to prove the scientific theory. theory. We use mathematics uh, to, yes, to yeah. help us prove our scientific theories, but then mathematics is a science itself. So we should like all other sciences except so far. But it doesn't depend on time. So if we say there are, I don't know, 15 chairs in this room, we don't always bring more. But I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe uh, I feel like mathematics is a language written by men, so it's like, it's like that, like a number is a number, it does not change, maybe this is what we feel like, probably when in mathematics they know all about it and they treat it like a, like a science because it is a science, but um, I think maybe we have this um, opinion about it, I don't know. Okay. okay. I have this feeling. Okay. Uh, like, how can it be 
valuable it's manuals. <laughs> right, right, right. Again, a good intuition uh, that you should try to uh, to make it more to make more force. Mm. What do you think? So you're saying we created the numbers. Mm. What does that mean? I don't it's, know. Zinera seems to. It's uh, uh, an uh, exacting science or black. It's uh, an uh, exciting exact science. science. Yeah. Black or white? Black or white. <laughs> so whatever mathematics says is clear and definitive. It's clear. It's safe. It's simply to explain um, things with mathematics. With uh, other science, the more difficult. But Valeria said something important. She said, we created mathematics. It's not an object in the universe. There is no number anywhere. It's a way to communicate. It's a language. Mm -hmm. it, it's... No, I wouldn't say it's a language. It is a language, yes. It can be used as, as a language. Uh, but mathematics, unlike all natural sciences, does not concern itself with natural objects. It concerns itself with abstractions. When mathematics talks about triangles, it doesn't think about this triangle, or that triangle, or that triangle. It talks about triangles. If you think a university level uh, textbook on geometry, there is not one figure. They do not use figures at all. They use only formulas. Because figures are misleading. If you think of this triangle, you might, you know, make mistakes because there are other triangles that do not behave like this one. So, mathematics deals with relationship among abstract objects. Those relationships are purely logical. And logics, we believe, is one and absolute. There are no alternative logics. We all think, we all use the same logics, whether we are aware or not. Most of us are not aware of what logics we use. But then again, if I make a logical argument, even more if it is an abstract object, you cannot really say, no, you are wrong. It's this other way around. Because it would be using a wrong logic. So, it is reasonable to suppose that mathematics is absolute. Does it make sense? Yes, but uh, I think also that uh, we start to do mathematics uh, for uh, the traffic things. So yeah. to count, uh, to no, to measure, yeah. and so why it uh, can be considered is uh, like uh, I don't know. Well, there is a distinction between what mathematics is and what it is used for. Mathematics is used for a huge number of practical purposes, but it's still abstract and concerned only with logic, concerned only with uh, a relationship between among abstract objects. So, I took the question seriously. In the next lesson, I came up with a couple of slides <coughs> to answer the question. Okay, here comes another famous painter, Kurt Gödel, who was a uh, logician, mathematician in the 20th century, who, in 1931, published two incomplete, so-called incompleteness theorems. Now, at the time, mathematics
this was really believed to be absolute and eternal. And it is really. Mathematics is the most solid, solid building we've ever built. But we have shown that even mathematics is not completely absolute. What did it do? First of all, I remind you that every mathematical system is made like this. You have a certain number of basic axioms from which you start. Axioms are now demonstrated, are taken for granted, are taken for true. It doesn't matter whether they are or not, you can choose them at the way you prefer. Then, on this basis, you demonstrate theorems, and then using these theorems, and, and maybe uh, again the axioms, you demonstrate more theorems, and then you demonstrate more theorems, and so on. So you have basically an inverted, uh, an upside down environment with very few axioms at the uh, apex, and then the finally it goes up and becomes enormous. That's a mathematical system. Uh, arithmetics is a mathematical system. Calculus is a mathematical system. Calculus is what we call uh, calculated reasoning. All right, so it seems quite reasonable that mathematician mathematicians at the time were convinced of this. But the very least you can ask of a group of axioms is twofold. First, they must, they must be complete. That is, there must be here enough axioms to demonstrate that any statement within this mathematical system is true or not. If you cannot demonstrate that a statement is true or not, then there are not enough axioms. You need to add more. Also, and perhaps more important, the axioms should be consistent with one another. You cannot take these two axioms and demonstrate, and demonstrate a theorem which is inconsistent with another one that you demonstrate with other axioms. They cannot be. Because it would, be, would demonstrate a proof and at the same time an opposite proof. That's impossible in mathematics. So, mathematicians believe. Now, here comes Kurt Gödel, who published his first theorem, which says if a mathematical system is consistent, that is, it is not possible to demonstrate theorem in contrast, in contrast with each other. Consistent or is coherent, it cannot be complete. That is, within that system, there will always be statements, which true statements, which cannot be demonstrated. Okay? Now, that was already uh, shaking the mathematical world, but in a way, was sort of acceptable. You know, there is maybe a little chance that sometime in the future we'll run into a statement that we cannot demonstrate. It's okay. So, but whatever we can demonstrate is still true. But the second theorem is devastating. Here is the second one. The consistency, the coherence of the axioms of a mathematical system cannot be proven within the system itself. That is, if I take this mathematical system, say arithmetics, I cannot prove that the axioms at the basis of arithmetics are consistent with one another. So there is a possibility that arithmetics, we don't have a, 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 an actual example, but it is possible that arithmetics will prove two theorems that are in contrast with the future. 
Okay, but there is an escape way. Arithmetics can be contained within uh, higher order mathematical systems. That is, with calculus, you can demonstrate that these axioms are indeed consistent. The problem is that calculus cannot demonstrate its own axioms are consistent. And so, you can go from one system to the next one, but still, you'll never have the final proof. Too boring? <laughs> and so, in fact, uh, as I said, mathematica, mathematics is an incredibly solid edifice. So, there is no question about its value. But if you ask mathematics to be the absolute, then I should say that even mathematics, mathematics is it. And so, really, all science is never forever. And this, I think, is all I have to say.